Thank you so much, Jan, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to everybody who's here for the third and final panel. And I know we're between you and the refreshments and the socializing. And we also have a panel of nine faculty members who um, I think are going to do their best to limit their remarks to two and a half minutes. But that doesn't belittle the amount of knowledge that they have and their uh, really important research that they're doing. So we're going to talk today in this panel about accelerating 21st uh, century cures for animal and human health. As I mentioned, the faculty members um, here today are from two colleges, College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and Natural Sciences, showing great breadth of um, disease research across colleges at Colorado State University. And this panel was inspired by federal legislation that's currently being considered in Congress that's been sponsored um, and promoted by uh, Ms. Diana DeGette, the representative from the 1st Congressional District of Colorado. So we're really excited about that advocacy. And this legislation would help to advocate for acceleration of cures for pressing health care problems, both chronic diseases and emerging diseases across the globe. So. Um, while there's been admittedly great gains in the process for healthcare delivery and um, exciting new uh, discoveries of drugs that have helped to mitigate some of our um, epi epidemic diseases, there's still a lot of uh, work to be done in providing cures for a lot of our most important diseases. And one of the um, statistics that's difficult uh, to understand and also a real limitation to how fast we can produce the next generation of drugs or the new uh, diagnostics to, to identify diseases is that the average time it takes from the time a drug is identified as a potential therapeutic agent for a disease until it's actually tested um, and safely um, branded by the FDA and then manufactured and released to the public is 10 years. And the cost for production of this single therapeutic agent is over two and a half billion dollars. So that's a huge uh, limitation to how, um, how we can actually continue to improve uh, human health and well-being, not only locally uh, in Colorado, uh, nationally and then across the globe. So why does it take so long? What are some of the limitations that limit um, the potential for discovery to market? And sorry for this pretty boring slide. I was looking at all everybody's beautiful slides and thought, this slide is going to be kind of a, a dud. But, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm pretty proud. I'm not using my notes very much. But this was um, a little cue for me to, to talk about something that's really important, and that's basic science discovery. This is the type of experimentation that's required to even come up with an idea of how can we have the next best vaccine or how can we have a new type of drug for example, that would be able to treat antimicrobial resistance for organisms that are already resistant to every known uh, antibiotic. Those types of infections are be becoming more and more common, um, being seen in hospitals and um, very commonly seen in the general public. And we have to have very specific knowledge about very minute details of the agents that cause those diseases in order to get some clues about what's a specific molecular tool we can use that will cause that um, microbe to be impacted negatively so that disease is mitigated, but it doesn't cause very severe disease for the person or the animal that's getting that drug. So there's very sophisticated study that might be very molecularly oriented, and those are some things that occur at CSU and are really vital to feeding the pre-pipeline of new drugs and discoveries. Um, this is also true not just for microbes, but for diseases such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease that afflict a great number of not only Americans, but these are becoming global issues in um, health of human populations. And in order to, to find better cures with less side effects, we really need to understand the physiology at a very basic level. You all have heard about disease emergence and Ebola and West Nile virus, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome that's now a problem in South Korea for reasons we don't understand. And in order to able for us to understand um, how and predict the next emergent infection, we have to consider ecology. And this gets to the, the broader global issues that the other panels have talked about. It's not just the pathogen itself, but it's how the environment causes that pathogen to emerge. And the reservoirs for these diseases are often animal hosts. Um, I think one of our panelists, Dr. Bowen, is going to show some statistics about the number of diseases that originate, infectious diseases that originate in wildlife. 
um, or in animals, and it's, it's more than 50%. Uh, um, so we have to study these factors as well to be able to make predictive models and to be able to try to estimate when the next infection may occur and how dangerous it would be. Example of this would be um, we had several cases of a a uh, pretty rare disease called tularemia occur in people in Larimer County last year. So why in the world did that happen? This is a rare disease. It's, it's a bacteria uh, called Francisella tularensis that's responsible for this disease. It's actually considered a select agent, so it could be weaponized um, and is one of the pathogens when we study in the lab. We need to be very uh, careful about how we handle it, but we have people uh, walking into their uh, doctor's offices in Larimer County with this, this infection. Well, it turns out this agent, which is caused, is carried usually normally in rabbit populations, um, was hyperabundant last year because we had a couple of factors that came to bear. We had high rainfall in the spring that caused a lot of brush and, fo and feed for the rabbit population. And we also simultaneously had diseases going through the predator species. So fox and coyotes had outbreaks of distemper. So their populations were down. And these two factors allowed this amazing populations of rabbits to proliferate in Larimer County. I noticed I live on a country road and I was counting the rabbits on the way home and it was just like every two feet there was another rabbit. And I was thinking this is a, an evolutionary process that pretty soon the rabbits that don't get across the road won't be in the population anymore. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, this huge abundance of rabbits caused more focal concentrations of tularemia that provided more environmental exposure to people. And without really realizing that, without having our diagnostic lab at CSU to identify this problem in rabbits, it might have gone by the wayside and it might have caused significant disease and even death in people that were uh, infected because it's such a rare agent. So that's an example of how we need to understand all the factors that contribute to disease emergence in order to be more prepared. And then finally, um, diagnostics are an important type of um, new measure that we have to consider the days of taking uh, 20 mils of blood from a person and sending it to the lab and having it cultured uh, and getting the results two weeks later is just not going to be um, the type of um, medicine we can practice. And so we have multiple individuals at CSU that are, are working on improved diagnostics. So all of those things fit into this more horrendous type of um, uh, pipeline, which shows that for 10,000 drugs, once they're identified as potential therapeutic agents, um, only one of them and actually ends up going to market because along the way of the animal testing and the clinical testing that needs to occur, um, those are weeded out, and that's why it takes 10 years and two and a half billion dollars for one drug to, to come to market. So at CSU, um, we have people working all along this pathway, and four of our speakers I characterized as um, individuals who are working in the early discovery arena primarily, but then we have speakers today that will talk about their work in laboratory modeling and animal testing, and also individuals who are doing um, human clinical trials along the pathway from efficacy to um, FDA review, and even a unique um, uh, area at CSU for drug uh, production. So um, the panel that we have today, um, we have initially um, one of our early career faculty, Elizabeth Ryan, who's already, um, her work's already been talked about by Jan, where she's using um, a food waste product to, to look at nutritional um, uh, impacts to developing countries in particular. Dr. Greg Ebel is the director of our world-renowned arbovirus-borne infectious disease laboratory at Colorado State University, which is a group of about eight faculty studying diseases transmitted by mosquitoes and other insects, such as malaria. Dick Bowen will talk about his really interesting work on disease reservoirs. Dick, in his lab, has done work on camels, bats, alligators, and um, a whole variety of other Noah's Ark um, to look at what the role of those animals are in transmitting infection to humans. Dr. Mary Jackson is the director of the Mycobacteria Research Lab. This is another center at CSU that's a world-class institution studying everything from the microbiology to the macrobiology of um, tuberculosis disease. And then Dr. Diane Ordway is a faculty member in this group who's going to talk about her novel diagnostic work to detect um, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis infections in people, and her work is funded by the, the Gates Foundation. Dr. Melissa Reynolds is going to talk about her work. Um, she's a chemist, and she's 
determined ways to manufacture implants, which we all would have if we went to the doctor and got a catheter or had other types of interventions that are uh, safer and result in fewer side effects for patients that are, are uh, needing to have those uh, medical technologies. And then Dr. Chuck Henry is going to talk about his work to identify infectious agents in particular, but other types of uh, biologicals using inexpensive, accurate um, sensor technologies. Dr. Rod Page will talk about his work as director of the Flint Animal Cancer Center, another center at CSU that's the, the um, world-renowned uh, um, center for veterinary cancer therapy and how there's exciting new opportunities to translate the findings in animals that have naturally occurring cancers that translate specifically to human cancers. And that can actually potentially accelerate that drug development pipeline and result in, in great advances for both veterinary and human. Uh, therapies. And then our final speaker, Dr. Dennis Piero, will get to talk about his, his um, uh, institute, Biomark, which is a good manufacturing practice facility at CSU that can gear up to make these biologicals uh, for therapies and for diagnostics. So this is the tip of the iceberg of um, the cream of the crop faculty that are working on some of these issues. Um, but just to say, just to let you know, there are nearly 80 faculty at CSU that are working on infectious disease research. And last year they expended in their laboratories nearly $50 million to look for cures and accelerate the drug delivery process for human health. And um, I think with that, we will have our panel come up. I did want, one other thing I want to mention is that we do have a lot of um, collaborations with people who have already been in the previous panels, and we have a new um, initiative at CSU called the One Health Institute, and our new director, Dr. Bruno Sobrala, is actually in the audience here. He'll be starting in the fall, but this is a, this is a um, institute that actually looks at um, implications of environmental, animal, and human health in, in a systems biology approach that will tackle some of these big pro problems in a solution-oriented way. So with that, I'll ask my panel to come up and we'll do our best to um, give you a great snapshot of our, our work at CSU. And I guess I'm sitting on the tall chair, so sorry. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a condition that everybody's experienced, okay? Diarrhea. Everybody's <laughs> had it, right? Um, I mean, it's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> and you don't want to have it very long, and you know it's going to end, and you're going to be okay, right? I mean, and this is, but in the developing countries, uh, this is not the case, and we've known this for decades, okay? And we've come up with solutions, water sanitation, we've tried oral rehydration salts, we've done all kinds of environmental cleanup. I mean, there's, there, it, it's still, we're still having this massive problem, particularly in children under the age of five, and particularly when you have these conditions of malnutrition. And so, um, you know, one of the, th we need to come up with some new solutions, and, and so one of the ideas um, came back from something I'd heard about, which was in a small part of India where there was, um, you know, uses of rice bran. And so, as Jan mentioned earlier, this is a byproduct of rice processing. Uh, 70 million metric tons of rice bran are produced every year. Most of it is largely wasted and used for animal feed, though. I mean, now more and more, I'd say, um, as we go around the country, we know it's being used for animal feed. We just started in the laboratory, though, uh, about four or five years ago with money from the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation uh, to do some preclinical work in animal models and just see how effective is it for salmonella, E. coli, rotavirus, the leading causes of gastroenteritis in children. Um, and we've had some great results. And so I'm proud to say now that we've been developing rice bran as a food ingredient and we're feeding infants and young children in places like Nicaragua and Mali and West Africa to start. We're hoping to expand these studies and find out if there's some opportunity to really prevent and address this diarrheal disease condition and also simultaneously address some of the malnutrition that's um, making it really an, a major cause of morbidity and mortality today. Okay. Um, so 
So thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Ebel. I'm the director of uh, the CSU Arthropod Borne and Infectious Diseases Lab. And I want to start by directing your attention to the figure that, that I stole from Bill Gates's blog on the left side of, of the screen that lists the impact of the most deadly animals in the world. What should be immediately obvious to you when you look at that figure is that the most deadly animal on the planet is not a shark or a rattlesnake or a lion or a bear. Um, it's a mosquito. They're even more deadly than human beings. So the reason that they're so deadly is that when they take a blood meal from you, uh, which they need to do in order to complete their life cycle, they have the opportunity to inoculate viruses, parasites, and other pathogens. And there's a lot of great examples of these. Um, we heard about West Nile virus already. Uh, chikungunya virus and dengue viruses are persistent problems in the tropics. And this is to say nothing of malaria, which impacts millions of people each year. So the Arthropod Born and Infectious Disease Laboratory at CSU, as Sue mentioned, is nine faculty. We're incredibly collaborative and integrated. And our goal is essentially to make that red box smaller. That's what we're trying to do. And so in order to do that, uh, the faculty that are part of our group have both uh, basic science and applied projects. Some examples of the basic science that we're doing include studies of RNA virus evolution, mechanisms of insecticide resistance, uh, all kinds of different projects. Uh, we also have a lot of applied uh, projects that tend to be towards vaccine development, finding new uses for old drugs. There's a picture of one of our faculty members at the bottom center who's using ivermectin to help control malaria in Central Africa. Um, we also are, are very excited uh, because um, we're thinking about new ways of, of using mosquitoes. And so um, for the last few seconds, I only have two minutes and 30 of them. Um, I want to I want to just tell you about a project that we're really excited about because we're thinking about using mosquitoes in a completely different way. So the idea here is that mosquitoes are biting people in resource poor parts of the world all the time and they're doing it anyway. And the idea is that in those mosquitoes there's blood and that the blood has information about the health of the people. And so what we're doing is we have developed uh, collaborators in uh, at the Department of Defense and in Liberia and throughout the world. Um, and we've been very fortunate to be supported by the Defense Department and by our, our CSU uh, BPR. We take the mosquitoes that have fed on people living in huts, we bring them back to the lab, squeeze out the contents of their, um, of their blood, of their, their midguts onto filter paper, which preserves the contents, and then we can bring that back to the lab and analyze it. And why we're so excited about this is we just recently have been getting some new data, and it seems like it actually works. So not only is it a new way of, uh, of, of using and looking at mosquitoes, but we think we're actually going to be able to use this for biosurveillance. My name is Dick Bowen. I, uh, virtually everything I do is collaborative. Um, the thing that gets myself and my students, most of my students, up in the morning is the study of the so-called emerging infectious diseases. Now, that, that term's used a lot, and really what it kind of means is uh, pathogens that are newly recognized or are showing up in new spots around the world. So the Ebola outbreak that we witnessed recently is still considered an emerging infection infectious disease. So my, my uh, primary interest is in the animal reservoirs for these um, emerging infectious diseases. And as Sue kind of alluded to, that pie chart on the, on the first slide uh, indicates an important point, and that is that it's, it's crystal clear that roughly two-thirds of these um, deadly, if you will, emerging infectious diseases of humans originate in some kind of an animal reservoir, and, and half of them actually in wildlife. So as people encroach on wildlife territories more and more, we're coming in contact with their pathogens. Um, next slide. <laughs> so um, the virus I thought I would tell you about is, is a truly emerging infection, and that's um, MERS coronavirus. So MERS stands for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Virus. This was first recognized in 2012 uh, in a patient that died in Saudi Arabia, and it has since been recognized in a number of those Middle Eastern countries. Of course, with transport, global transport systems as they are today, uh, it was inevitable and it has occurred that people travel to the Middle East, pick up that virus, go back to their own countries and spread this virus across the world. Sue also just mentioned um, the recent or the ongoing outbreak in uh, South Korea. As of this morning, there have been 122 uh, confirmed cases of MERS um, in South Korea and nine fatalities. So <laughs> the, the big question when MERS was first discovered is where is this coming from? 
and most people, myself included, assume that there's got to be some kind of an animal reservoir. The two, uh, the two species high on the suspect list initially were bats, uh, insectivorous bats, and camels. <laughs> and there's, um, so, so our, part of our capability at CSU, we have the facilities and the expertise that allow us to uh, safely manipulate these viruses and look at their effects on natural hosts, a variety of natural hosts. Um, and so, so we started looking uh, at bats and at camels. The story in bats is an anticlimax, really quite boring. The, uh, if we inoculated two species of insectivorous bats, granted they were North American bats with this virus, and saw no shedding, uh, no disease, nothing. There, and there hasn't really been any field data to support the role of bats in the epidemiology of MERS. Um, camels were also highly suspect, and we, as you see in that one picture with one of my um, graduate students, she's not really that small, it's just kind of the <laughs> s scale. We don't use children in these studies, <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but, um, but um, we inoculated dromedary camels with this um, virus. They developed an extremely mild respiratory disease that might even go unnoticed. But what they did was shed huge amounts of virus and nasal secretions. And the amounts of virus that uh, I think it's just uh, obvious that would uh, infect humans in contact with those camels. So what we're doing now to um, um, proceed from that particular study is we're collaborating with National Institutes of Health and some other groups to um, test vaccines in camels. The idea being that if we could develop a vaccine that would protect camels and, and decrease or eliminate shedding, then that uh, would be useful in protecting human populations. My name is uh, Mary Jackson. I'm a bacteriologist and a geneticist, and I serve as the director of the Mycobacteria Research Laboratories at CSU. Um, so the main focus of our research is tuberculosis, the second most deadly infectious disease in the world after HIV AIDS. Uh, and we study TB in humans, of course, but we also study uh, TB in livestock and wildlife and the, trans the transmission of TB from animal to humans and vice versa. We're also interested in two neglected tropical diseases caused by mycobacteria. One is leprosy and the other one is uh, burly ulcer. And in more recent years, we got interested in some so-called non-tuberculous mycobacteria because some of them are presently considered emerging pathogens causing more and more infections, uh, including hospital-acquired infection throughout the world, and some uh, epidemic lineages are apparently emerging. So as you can imagine, each of these diseases uh, really pose unique challenges, but I think it's fair to say that for all of them, in each of them, there is an unmet medical need in terms of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Uh, and secondly, all of these bacteria are intrinsically extremely resistant to antibiotics, which makes the infection they cause uh, obviously very difficult to treat. Next slide, please. So how do we make a difference at CSU? So. The first thing is that we are about 160 researchers at CSU, including 24 faculty, 80 students, postdoctoral fellows in training, uh, working on, on these bacteria, which makes us the largest academic group dedicated to the study of mycobacterial diseases in the United States and possibly in the world. And the second thing that's important to emphasize is that um, the MRL, Mycobacterial Research Labs, pioneered a lot of the animal models of infection that are currently used in the preclinical testing of uh, drug vaccine and diagnostics. Uh, and so this allows us to test not only products and ideas coming from our own research, but we also test for other labs throughout the world, uh, private companies and foundations, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, candidate drugs and vaccines that go through our preclinical models and from there uh, we help people decide if this product should advance to clinical trials or not. So that's all I'm allowed to tell you about the MRI <laughs> right now because I, someone's going to shut me off otherwise, but I'll hand it over to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Diane Ord, who is going to tell you more about the work she's doing on the diagnostics of multidrug resistant TB. So my name is Diane Ordway and I'm an infectious disease immunologist. And so it's one, um, shocking fact is actually there's an extra 10 million people this year that will lose their lives to drug-resistant infections. And so 
Uh, it's one thing to read this in a report, but it's quite a different thing to actually work with patients that have drug-resistant infections. And so as you see on the slide, this is Miguel. Um, he uh, came into the hospital Egej Muniz uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, where I was working, and he was uh, diagnosed with mycobacterium tuberculosis. You can call it TB or tuberculosis, which uh, Miguel d got this infection from somebody else that was coughing it up, and he breathed it in. And so he had a drug-sensitive infection, and uh, uh, what this bacteria does when it gets into your lungs is it, it basically destroys your lungs. Obviously, you need your lungs to live. So uh, it's very lethal. And so he had a drug-sensitive uh, strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and so basically the clini clinicians gave him uh, a standard uh, drug uh, treatment regime of nine months and sent him on his way. Unfortunately, what happened is Miguel, about six months later, showed up in the clinic coughing up blood. So what Miguel did is he started to feel better on the drugs. He stopped taking the drugs. And then the infection came back, the bacteria changed. And so in the clinic, he uh, had acquired a multi-drug resistant infection, which is very complicated because he uh, ended up having to take more toxic drugs that cost a lot more money and for a lot longer time. So he uh, inevitably developed various complications to these more toxic drugs. And although he fought a really good battle for three years, he lost his life. And so, really, it's quite different, as I said, reading a report and actually working with patients with drug resistance. My research is really focused on um, getting new, non-invasive, uh, point-of-care diagnostics for patients like Miguel and patients uh, all around the world. And it's based on breath, excelled breath. So using breath as a di uh, rapid diagnostic parameter. And so what we're doing at CSU is actually using exhaled breath. We're breaking down the components of that exhaled breath into molecules. And so we can detect from breath, because there's a molecular shedding of your blood through your uh, lung cavity, of any type of infections you have. So we can uh, identify that infection, the specific infection, and then also identify if that infection is drug resistant or drug susceptible. So we're using uh, discoveries with our preclinical modeling, and we're also trying to increase efficacy, obviously, in the public human health sector. Uh, if you see the slide uh, where the individual is taking a breast sample, it's much like asthmatics do routinely uh, in this country to monitor th their asthma, and also much like the alcohol breath test. So we're really wanting to shove this technology so we can use uh, handheld breath analyzers, not just these large um, current equipment that we use to analyze breath, but also using a lot of Chuck Henry's um, sensor uh, arrays so that we can actually have positive and negative readouts of whether an individual is infected with, with a certain pathogen and if it's drug resistant or not. That's all. One back. Perfect. My name is Melissa Reynolds, and I'm from the Department of Chemistry and School of Biomedical Engineering. And uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is some of the work that my students have been working on in terms of making safer, more effective medical devices. So clotting and infection still remain a huge problem with medical device technologies. In fact, in surgical centers, usually teams of physicians are required to basically manage the clotting versus material type of interactions. Infection is also a huge problem. Once implanted devices become infected, really the best course of option is to remove them and then replace them, and I'm sure none of us here in this room want that to happen to us. So the real question that we try to ask is, how do we move from these devices that are prone to these negative interactions to those that can actually support and overcome these types of interactions? So we do this by thinking about how we can change or use medical devices to work in concert with what our body does naturally. And secondarily, we think about how can we create these new types of materials platforms and at the same time integrate them into current manufacturing processes. This is the idea of being able to accelerate the idea of bench to bedside with medical device technologies. 
So the latest uh, example that my students have been able to create is they've created these tiny little crystals that you can put on catheters or on stents or on vascular grafts that when exposed to the blood will not pose any toxic or systemic effects, which means that if patients received our devices, which they haven't yet, they're not on the market, um, you would be able to use them without having to take anticoagulants for the rest of your life. And at the same time, we've been able to work with other companies to be able to think about how we can uh, integrate these into their own manufacturing processes. And I think this is a real big key for translating technologies in the medical device space out of the university, and that is we aren't requiring manufacturers to create a new process, which then increase the cost of the devices at the end. Instead, we're integrating that all into the chemistry that the students have created and published on, and in that way, we use material design approaches with manufacturing integration to be able to accelerate the bench to bedside, to be able to bring better medical devices to the public. So my name is Chuck Henry, I'm a faculty member in chemistry, chemical and biological engineering, um, and biomedical engineering. And as was alluded to earlier, I wanna talk a little bit about sensing and, and new sensor chemistry. Um, and, and really, I think the, the story that starts this is, is going back to, to what Elizabeth said, that we've all experienced the, the negative side effects of, of food poisoning, and sometimes that's an inconvenience, and sometimes it's significantly um, uh, uncomfortable, um, but it can also be deadly, uh, you know, as experienced, and was shown in this slide here, uh, the, the Listeria outbreak that originated out of, out of Colorado. So if you ask yourself why... Um, why can't we ad address this problem better? I mean, we can send, as one of uh, the, uh, the audience knows, people into space, but yet we know, in this case, what Listeria does to us, but we can't stop it when we'd like to. Why is that? And I would argue it's because at this time, the way we do that is takes too long and costs too much. And so well, the way we're addressing this, if you go to the next slide, Sue, um, is thinking about taking traditional diagnostic tools like shown here on the, uh, on the left as you're looking to the side that are housed in a large centralized laboratory that take a long time at a high cost to give results that may or may not be relevant and translate those, in this case, into sensors that can provide relevant results at the point of care when they're needed. In my lab, we're doing this with very simple materials um, sensors made from filter paper and wax and, and very common everyday materials. Um, but we're part of a larger team on campus that are developing sensors um, out of a variety of, of materials. They include people like Ken Reardon, who spoke earlier. Uh, and, and going even though beyond simply the sensors, but what do we do with the data? How do we process the data? And then the last step, which is how do we really think about this? How as a society do we interact with this data if we're gonna, if we're gonna do these kind of, of measurements at the citizen level to better understand the spread of disease and how we can prevent it from entering into the, the, the human system? Hi, I'm uh, Rod Page. I'm the director of the Flint Animal Cancer Center. Uh, the Flint Animal Cancer Center is the largest uh, center devoted to the understanding and treatment of companion animal cancer in the world. We have about 20, 25 faculty and about 100 people altogether across campus that are involved with basic and translational research, both for the benefit of animals and humans. Uh, we've been uh, in existence for probably about 30, 35 years and have been funded through that time period by federal and uh, corporate and philanthropic uh, sources to conduct research that looks at some of the fundamental uh, opportunities to integrate cancer research and treatment across species. In addition to managing the, uh, the patients that walk through our door, these are animals that develop cancers very spontaneously over the course of their lifetime. They're owned by individuals that come from around the world to see us because of the technology and the expertise that has developed at CSU. There's about a million dogs and about uh, maybe half a million cats a year that get cancer. Uh, in comparison, there's about a half a million people a year that get cancer. So our, our premise is that cancer is cancer. Uh, the more we look, depending on uh, what sort of uh, platform you wanna, wanna use, we can't distinguish a cancer in a dog from a cancer in a human. 
we can certainly distinguish the dog and the human, <laughs> but under the microscope and from an expression analysis platform, we can't tell which is which. They, they randomly assort. That gives us opportunities to investigate new types of treatments and targets that might be available uh, that will come along. A couple of examples of some of the things that have happened here over the last couple, uh, couple of decades. On the uh, left of your screen is Emily Brown, who was diagnosed with osteosarcoma of the spine when she was 10. Uh, through research that we conducted and through the cooperation with her uh, pediatric oncologist at uh, Children's Hospital in Denver, uh, we identified a particular compound that resulted in her being able to overcome some of the resistance mechanisms that uh, allowed her to continue, and she just uh, a year ago graduated from college. Uh, on the right is uh, Dr. Steve Withrow, who's a, uh, a surgeon, an oncologic surgeon, who developed a procedure to save the limbs of dogs that get bone cancer. That is currently the standard of care for kids with bone cancer. And Angela is on the left, and Angela has just turned about 17. So these are the opportunities that we have. Uh, oh, yeah, next slide, please. What we think we can do is to create an integrated uh, mechanism where we can utilize the uh, patients that we see with the human patients that walk into uh, an oncologist's office to better accelerate the pace of cancer drug development. It's true that over 90% of cancer drugs that are uh, initiated in the clinical trial pipeline never make it. Uh, that's much higher than in other classes of compounds. One of the reasons is that the traditional rodent species uh, that are used and the other normal uh, types of, tr of evaluations are just not predictive of the cancer situation in humans. The patients we see are uh, similar. They're uh, usually uh, elderly dogs and cats that have concurrent issues that are on med medication similar to uh, human patients might be, and we found that we can help to predict uh, whether a particular drug is going to be uh, particularly tolerable in a human much better than a rodent or a dog, uh, normal dog's uh, treatment process. But we can insert uh, uh, the system throughout the process of drug development evaluation. So we, ve we believe that uh, the answer to cancer is usually walking right beside you. My name is Dennis Piero. I'm, I'm the last speaker, uh, <laughs> so now that I have your attention, I'm very, very happy to introduce Biomark. It's a contract manufacturing uh, service unit of the university. Uh, we uh, care and focus on the drug product, that material that's inside that vial. Uh, uh, I think it goes unnoticed and unthought about when we do talk about uh, drugs and, and um, therapeutics for, for individuals, but our job is to translate basically good ideas, good products, and then get them into humans. We specialize in, in what's called GMP production of high containment biologics. GMP stands for good manufacturing practices, and this is in, a, uh, in the Code of Federal Regulations actually on, on how to manufacture things for human use. So we have to follow FDA uh, regulations, of course, as w and that comes from the, the code. High containment biologics, um, the way I describe it is if you think about a vaccine, uh, you, the old classical model is to take a bad bug and you grow it up and then you kill it and it becomes a very good vaccine. Uh, you need the infrastructure to grow up that bad bug at some point and that's the specialty we have. It's a very uh, unique infrastructure that the university has, uh, very few of them across the country on a contract basis uh, and this is what we do. The next slide. Uh, we are unique in that we have been FDA inspected. Uh, uh, so we have partnered with a commercial client. Uh, one of our products is out on the marketplace right now. Types of products that we do manufacture are tuberculosis diagnostics. We are developing in partnership with the DOD an Ebola vaccine, a West Nile vaccine. We've done an HIV vaccine and we can do a Clostridium botulinum toxin for, for migraines and other things. On the left is an HIV vaccine. That's actually me. Uh, and on the right is the tuberculosis one. So just showing the depth of things that we can do at the university here. Uh, and again, this is us taking good ideas and getting them to patients. Uh, we do partner with academic, government, industry partners in both U.S. contracts as well as international contracts. Uh, we have about $30 million invested in our infrastructure, 37 employees, 
uh, and we do about $5 million a year in revenue. These are contracts, and so delivering. A and the shorter the message that I'd like to, to leave you with is this is CSU to patients. What we make uh, in our facilities, in our regulated facilities with our trained personnel, goes into humans uh, in clinical trials uh, or in partnership on a commercial level. So a direct connection between us and the public uh, is biomarker. Okay, um, congratulations to this excellent panel for coming in under the wire, and we have actually 10 minutes for questions, so I hope we have some interested people with some curious questions. Emeritus Professor at Colorado State uh, from the Department of Environmental uh, Health Sciences and currently reside here in the uh, D.C. area. thought I had a question for you because I spent 10 years here working uh, with the NIH and the National Cancer Institute in epidemiology, but primarily looking at uh, the association between environmental agents and cancer. And I think that there, uh, I know that there was a great deal of interest in um, some of the work that was one done by John Reif and others at, at Colorado State on using the animal population as a surrogate, the companion animal population as a surrogate for cancer epidemiological studies. And I'm just wondering if that's still of interest and if that could be developed in your opinion. It is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that work is is uh, really really seminal to understanding uh, issues related to prevention and early detection, and it is uh, certainly a component of the of the program. In fact, uh, CSU and an Animal Health Foundation have partnered to create a uh, a lifetime longitudinal study to evaluate uh, golden retrievers, which are you know wonderful dogs, very popular, and seem to have a high risk of uh, developing cancer. To identify the environmental and uh, dietary and exposure uh, systems that work in concert with genetic alterations to produce uh, cancer and, and other diseases as well. So we do, uh, we have a lot. Dr. Uh, Ryan and I have had, uh, had projects looking at environmental pesticides and, and heavy metals that are influenced uh, and will influence the development of uh, cancers in companion animals as well. So it's still a very, very, uh, very active area, but one we could always use more more help and and so please come back. <laughs> oh hi, I'm, my name is Joe Dudley. I'm a CSU Department of Zoology 1976 graduate. I'm currently working with uh, Lidos Corporation. Uh, question for Dr. Piero. Is the West Nile virus vaccine you're working on, is that a horse vaccine or a human vaccine? Um, I keep, um, most of our contracts are under confidentiality agreements, but uh, uh, the ones that we do have experience with are on the human side. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I might just mention that that's another thing we have facilities and expertise to do. So. If I'm not mistaken, we have done the equine testing on all of the West Nile equine vaccines that are on the market today. Another question? Hi. Carol Luton, Vet Med, 1976. Sue, a question for you. You talked about tularemia. How did it spread? I mean, that's usually from hides. Where was it a different transmission than it us usually is? Um, actually, there were some environmental exposures. So uh, there's also the capacity. I think this happens sometimes when you're out mowing the lawn and you go over a spot where a rabbit might have died, or there's been a contamination in the environment. And I, th I don't know the exact uh, details of the cases, but several of them were environmental exposures. So. Uh, people working outside in their gardens versus the direct contact that's usually considered. Um, I don't know if any of you get. Right. So the typical, the classic um, disease uh, expression occurs when a hunter shoots a rabbit, which might be running a little slower because it has tularemia, and then skins the rabbit, and there's usually some cutaneous lesions. But there's also this pneumonic form that's usually from inhaling 
um, the organisms, and its infectious dose is very low. So I, I believe that a num most of the cases that occurred were from the environmental contact. There weren't any um, deaths from it, but there were quite a number of people that were exposed in that way. So I was wondering for M Melissa, your group, um, a lot of device groups, they um, are able to sort of be inter interdisciplinary uh, with people like from material science or engineering. Are there opportunities uh, in your group for, say, cross-pollination across those type of fields that are also typically involved with uh, device development? A absolutely, yes. So we believe that we can't really think about advancing medical device technologies without including everybody in the conversation, economists included, um, because we have to think about um, how all the different aspects of the chemistry, the biology, the engineering go together to try to give us these types of device platforms. So in my group, we've had engineers, we've had biologists, we I've had two business students, um, and then we have a range of different types of chemists. So. We, we need and we, we bring in everybody to help us solve these problems. Okay, I've been signaled that we're out of time, but Dr. Rudolph asked to come up and give some closing remarks. So um, thanks very much, everybody, for your attention. For the